everyone. Welcome back to our second Fossil Friday web chat of the day. Um, I'm Brittany Stromberg. I'm the Outreach and Communications Coordinator for the Western Science Center. We also have here Gabriel Santos, who's the Outreach and Communications Coordinator for the ALF Museum. And then we also have, <laughs> we also have um, Jeanette Perlow with us today. Hi, guys. So she's going to be our guest scientist today talking about her research on gonfotheres, which I'm particularly excited about because they are related to things I'm interested in, like mammoths and mastodons. Um, so um, before anyone has any questions for Jeanette while we are doing the stream, feel free to throw those in the chat and we will do our best to answer them at the end of her presentation. So. Uh, just a little information, uh, Jeanette Perlow is a third year PhD student at the University of Florida and Florida Museum of Natural History. Her research focuses on a population of six million year old four tusked elephant relatives, gonfotheres, to understand their ancient environment and how similar environmental changes affect herb mega herbivores in the present. Jeanette also enjoys going to the beach, reading books for leisure and snuggling with her cat in general. And my, I have to say that is a name. <laughs> Thanks. He does not go by the general, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, unfortunately. Awesome. Well, Jeanette, whenever you are ready, feel free to take it away. Yeah, let me just share my screen real quick. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, I hope everyone can see the screen okay. Um, all right, so let's get started for everyone for attending. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, gonfotheres and Brittany did a great job uh, um, describing them. And these are uh, a population of gonfotheres from north central Florida, about 30 minutes outside, um, 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how fast you drive really, uh, outside of Gainesville, Florida, which is north central Florida. Um, so just a quick outline, we'll just go over uh, where we are in geologic time when we're talking about the Montbrook fossil sites. Uh, we'll talk about the proboscidean family tree and how they uh, got to North America, specifically Florida. Um, we'll look at their teeth, um, discuss carbon and isotopes. Uh, and I believe this morning earlier, um, the previous speaker did talk about uh, clumped isotopes. So if you joined in earlier, um, you have a little bit of an idea about that. And then we'll talk about um, the stuff you guys actually are here for, which is the Montbrook fossil site and pictures of the fossils themselves. <clears throat> All right, so uh, geologic time. So as we know, um, geologic time scale is huge and the Montbrook fossil site is actually uh, in the last um, five to six years. And apparently I uploaded the wrong, um, slide to this, so I do apologize. Please ignore that bottom part. Um, but this is from about the Montbrook fossil sites, about five to six million years old. Um, it's located, like I said, in north central Florida, and it's right at the cusp of the Miocene-Pliocene uh, boundary. So a little bit on proboscidean evolution. So Proboscidea is this large group of um, elephant-like creatures. Uh, the only remaining species uh, alive now in present time are the African elephants and the Asian elephants. African elephants are split into two sub, um, subspecies, the bush or savanna elephants and the forest elephants, um, but they are still lumped under African elephants. And then there's Asian elephants. Um, they stem from a group of early proboscideans called uh, dinotheres, and that's in this bottom left-hand picture. Uh, this is a skull of a dinotheer, and they have these really cur cool recurved uh, lower tusks that you see down here at the bottom. Um, and they're just really cool animals. Um, the rest of the elephants come from the elephantif elephantiformes uh, group here and they split up into mammothidae or mastodons, gonfotheridae or gonfotheres, stegodontidae, stegodon um, stegodons ele and elephantidae which are the modern uh, group of elephants as well as mammoths. Um, so down at the bottom we just have several pictures here of the different types of proboscideans that you might be aware of, including the cool dinotherium, 
gonthotheres, which is the group I look at, mass, uh, mammoths, which are uh, the group that most people are aware of, as well as African, um, this African elephant here. All right, so um, proboscideans evolved in Africa and eventually dispersed across um, the Asian continent into North America. And this took several, several uh, million years to do so. Um, and they originated around the Paleocene um, and moved over. They migrated across the Bering Strait into North America about 16 million years ago. And gonfathiers were one of the first to reach North America. So we do have gonfathiers from Africa, um, the Middle East, and Asia. Uh, and only some species are endemic to North America, including the group that I study, which are the Rhynchotherium. And you can see down at the bottom here, we have, um, we've split up that group of Gonfotheridae uh, into several other uh, genuses, uh, genera. So we have Gonfotheria, Rhynchotherium, which is the group I study, Cuvironius, and Nodiomastodon. And it just gives you a little description of what's happening within each group. And what this uh, map doesn't show is that eventually some elephants did make it down into Mexico, Central America, and down into South America after uh, the Great American Biotic Interchange. Um, that might be a little debated depending on who you talk to. But once the Isthmus of Panama arose, uh, proboscideans did migrate south into South America. And one of the, my favorite thing about uh, proboscideans are their teeth. Um, so dinotheres, those uh, cool early proboscideans with the recurved tusks, have these uh, interesting teeth here that actually um, come in just like normal mammal teeth. So our teeth come uh, grow in a, uh, a vertical um, placement. So they move up into our teeth. So if you remember when your tooth fell out when you were a little kid, it kind of grew. You had the next one coming in from the bottom. Um, and then there's the rest of the elephants uh, that actually have uh, horizontal replacement as opposed to vertical replacement, where the functional tooth eventually falls out and a new one will grow back, in, uh, will grow in, coming in from the back of the mouth like a conveyor belt, very similar to sharks. Um, unlike sharks, though, they don't uh, replace their teeth throughout their lifetime once they get through the certain number of teeth that they're allotted per, um, per type of elephant, then essentially um, they start gumming their food once they've uh, run out of teeth. So these animals were eating, um, were obviously herbivorous uh, and some were grazers, meaning they were eating grasses like the mammoth here, or that they were browsers, meaning they were eating leaves and brush uh, like gonfotheres. And if we look at the chewing surface of the different elephant types, you see that the chewing surface is very different. Where the dinotherium have these uh, big cusps here where that they use to essentially crush leaves in between their teeth. Um, they're known to be C3 grazers or essentially eating leaves and herbaceous material. So they're crushing the crunchy leaves between their teeth. Same thing with gonfotheres, they're also considered browsers, but mammoths were uniquely adapted to eat grasses. So they're grazers and were able to grind those silica rich grasses between their teeth and essentially um, needed to have really big teeth so that they could live the long lives that they did um, and didn't rub their teeth down too soon. And if we look at the modern African elephant here on the left and the Asian elephant here on the right, you can see they still have very similar characteristics to um, mammoths, uh, but there are some changes. And so one of the cool things with mammoths and um, with mammoth teeth is that uh, the enamel plates end up wearing and falling off and being replaced by that new plate. Um, and then they're replaced by the next tooth. So they go through um, their teeth very slowly. Um, and have long lives as well. 
All right, so now on to gonfathir. So gonfathirs are really cool. If you guys had a chance to log into the um, East Tennessee uh, talk earlier today, um, they talked about the gray fossil site and the proboscideans that they have there. Um, and I believe they did talk about some of their gonfathirs. So gonfathirs are known to have these long uh, lower jaws and some have lower tusks and some do not. Uh, so just depending on which gonfathir type you're looking at may or may not have lower tusks. One cool factoid um, to know is some mastodons even have lower tusks um, and some of them do not. So a lot of the earlier mastodons you might see with lower tusks and some of the more recent mastodons may not have them. Um, but I thought it was cool to know that mastodons can grow lower tusks. Anyway, back to gonfathirs. Um, so they were the first to reach North America, like I mentioned earlier. And they're related to stegomastodons, Brinkitherium, and Cuvironius are all related. And like I mentioned, they're characterized by that long and low skull. So they have a very long skull. When you think of a mammoth skull, you think of a very tall um, back of the head. Um, but gonfathirs have a longer, lower skull. They have upper tusks with enamel bands. And you can see in this lower picture of the tusk, this kind of um, different colored textured portion, that's enamel. Um, and enamel is the same type of material that we have on our teeth. So the white part of our teeth is the enamel. And then the rest of the tusk itself is made out of dentin. Um, and tusks are actually modified incisors. So they are ever growing. Um, and a really cool, uh, another cool fact is that um, just like us, uh, elephants also have their baby teeth. So they go through their milk teeth, they eventually lose them and grow in their adult teeth. And tusks do the same thing. And they're really cute because they're about this size in gonfathirs in this group I study and they're just really kind of adorable. Um, but this enamel band is found on that upper tusk. Uh, often, but not always. Um, and sometimes you can find that enamel on the lower tusks, tusk as well, sometimes, but not always. So if you're starting to clue in, sometimes they have a feature, sometimes they don't. And so the group Gonfathy is just a, a, really, a really interesting mix of features. Um, they also have this downturn and elongated mandibular symphysis. And that really long last part, mandibular symphysis, is just a fancy way of saying chin. Um, but essentially, they have this really long, elongated chin where the lower tusks um, are coming out of. So if you can imagine, if you have a set of long tusks coming out of your chin, you need to have bony structure to hold them up. Um, so you would grow and modify your chin to, to hold those tusks up. Um, and like I mentioned, they have those elongated lower tusks. And some have thin lower tusks and some have really wide lower tusks. So if you were to Google like amabelodon or shovel tuskers, you would see that they have these really long, wide lower tusks that they would, people assume, use to scoop up material. All right, so now on to the Montbrook fossil site itself. Um, this is the first place that I ever had a chance to dig, and so it, it has my heart, and I will always love this place, I hope. Um, but like I mentioned, it's late Miocene, so about five to six million years old. Uh, we are categorizing it under the latest Hempalian age, and Hempalian is on uh, based on the North American land mammal age. Um, and so we date places uh, based on the types of mammals that were present. Um, and so uh, each country, each region really has a different type of mammal age. You'll find the South American land mammal ages, you'll find land ma mammal ages in Europe, and not always do they align. So here in Florida, we focus on the North American land mammal ages. And the one from Montbrook is the latest Hempalian. And we know based on the animals that we're finding at Montbrook that it falls under the latest Hempalian because there are Teleoceras, which is a type of rhinoceros, which I have pictured in here. This is a great, um, not of Montbrook, but a nice reconstruction for that correct age. Hexameric Simpsoni, which is a type of um, antelope, if you can imagine, uh, like pronghorn. 
and Borophagus hilly, which is a bone crushing dog. Um, Mockbrook is located in Levy County, Florida, and we believe it's a freshwater ecosystem close to the coastline based on the animals that we're finding. So we have lots of turtle, lots of alligator, lots of freshwater fishes, but we also have a lot of saltwater fishes, a lot of marine fishes. So we know that there's been some movement in and out um, close to the marine coast. And so just a quick picture, uh, a little background on the Montbrook site. So this top picture here, this is Hunter. Uh, Hunter was five years old when she actually discovered the site. Her grandfather, Eddie here, um, owns uh, acres of land in Levy County and uh, they were actually mining the sand to use for the foundation of the new high school that was being built um, just a couple miles away from, um, from the site itself and Hunter wanted to find dinosaurs. So she and her grandmother and her mom went for a walk um, at the site and she, you know, at the land, and she told them, you know, I'm gonna go find dinosaurs. And um, if you know a little bit about Florida geology, Florida was underwater during the time of dinosaurs. So her grandma was just kind of like, sure, sweetie, you're gonna go find some dinosaurs. They didn't think she was actually gonna find some bones because like I mentioned, Florida was underwater during the time of the dinosaurs, but she actually came back with the bones here in this bottom picture. Um, so they were kind of like, oh my God, did she find, did she really find dinosaur bones? Um, they eventually made this back to the Florida Museum and our collection manager identified these as elephant bones, some turtle bones, um, some fish bones. The next day they were out at the site, um, they found some more elephant bones and they started digging. And that was November of 2015. And since then we've been digging at the site um, twice a year or so. Right now we're closed down due um, to the virus, but um, we have plenty of backlog to work through. Um, all right, so what happens to the fossils once we find them in the field? So first we find them in the field and we have to protect them on their way back. Sometimes they're easy enough to just carry in bags and bring them back to the museum. Other times, especially with my elephant skulls, um, they need more protection to make it back. So uh, you see here big lumps of plaster. These are all filled with elephant skulls or mandibles um, and they will need to be uh, prepped before I graduate so that we know what's in them. Um, but eventually, essentially we cover the bone with plaster, same as you would when you break your arm um, to protect it in the moving process. We bring it back to the lab, we prepare the bone, meaning we re-dig it out of the sand, we glue it back together and make it um, uh, display ready, display and research ready. So at the site itself, we found uh, around 30 to 35 um, skulls and or mandibles that have been collected so far. We just found a, a new baby skull the past couple of weeks. If you've been following me on social media, you've seen some videos of the prep work I've been doing. Um, and confirmed, we have confirmed mastodons from the site and confirmed gonfotheres. They're probably from the genus Rhynchotherium but stay tuned um, over the next couple of years as I finish up my dissertation um, to figure out what it actually is. Uh, there may be more than one gonfotheer type, but um, that is left to be determined. And the really interesting thing about this site is we not only have um, adult elephants at the site, we also have really teeny tiny little babies, just born babies. Um, and we know this based on the teeth that are in their mouth. We can determine if it's their baby teeth or their adult teeth. Um, and then we also have a nice group of juveniles, that kind of teenage um, aged elephants uh, kind of running around Montbrook, which I think is really cool that we have this entire time series from babies to adults. All right, so now for the stuff that you're actually here for to see pictures. Um, this is an older picture. This is, of uh, you can just see here peeking out some teeth. Um, this is a complete skull with about a two foot long tusk 
um, kind of here on the far right um, that is still in the skull itself. So we have from the back of the skull all the way to the tip of um, the tusk and the tusk is not broken. We can see where it has been rubbed down. Um, so it's a fairly uh, complete and really important specimen um, that I've been working to clean and prep um, for my dissertational work uh, over the next couple years. So stay tuned with more pictures for that. Um, but on to the ones that have been prepped. Um, so let's turn down this volume. Um, so this specimen is really uh, near and dear to my heart because I think it is one really cool and really beautiful. Uh, but you can see here, there is a complete, nearly complete turtle shell um, smashed on top of this lower jaw. And you can see these teeth here. This is from a, uh, that juvenile um, teenage um, elephant uh, age group. Um, so we have a fairly complete lower jaw with that long chin here, but we also have this really nicely preserved um, turtle shell, which I think is beautiful. We debated about prepping uh, when we were preparing this, this jaw to remove that turtle actually, um, but it's just so cool and lends to so many great stories, both real and um, more uh, fanciful stories. Um, I have a uh, children's book idea that I, I may someday write um, based on this specimen alone. Um, and I think it's just really cool to show the different types of animals that were present all in one, um, in one specimen. So I would say this is one of my favorites itself. Um, this other one here is from a much older uh, individual and it's part of the skull itself. This is the upper jaw. And this here are the teeth. And you can see that they're kind of different colors. Um, and I think teeth are fascinating. And that's really one of the first things that drew me to these animals. Uh, the woman that is working to prep this, um, once we can go back to the museum, I think she's right about ready to flip this over and start working on the other side. Um, so I would say by the end of the year, this will be ready for research and display. And here's one of my favorites. So I have a soft spot for uh, the babies at the site. Um, this one's really cool because it's both the, the complete skull and the lower jaw of the same individual. We found them, um, we found the skull and the lower jaw um, pretty much right next to each other. So we know that they belong to the same individual. Sometimes that relationship is hard to, to make uh, because you never know if it's from the same individual or not unless they're attached. Because we found the jaw and the skull together, we know they're from the same individual. But this is really cute because it has its little baby teeth here and you can see it has these concavities. That means these tooth are worn. Whereas this tooth, this third tooth here, has very little wear. Um, so we're able to age the animal specifically based on the amount of wear on the teeth and the teeth that are present. And you can see here um, the next tooth uh, in the series that's going to erupt. So same as when you're a baby and your next tooth is coming in, they're also erupting their teeth. And like I said, they're moving forward in that conveyor belt like uh, fashion. And this area here is the front of the underside of the mouth. Um, and this is where the tusks would come out. So if you can imagine just two little baby tusks um, coming out of the skull, I just, I think they're adorable. Um, and like I said, I have a huge soft spot for these. Um, here's another video. Uh, and this is another portion of the upper jaw of another individual. And as you can see, it's much smaller than that first one that I showed you about two slides ago. Um, and based on the teeth themselves, we know it's from a different individual. And this specimen's actually at my house right now um, so that I can prep it during, during quarantine. Um, so stay tuned for more pictures of that. Um, but this is not as complete. We do have portions here that are part of the zygomatic arch or um, the cheekbones of the individual. So we know where in the skull this part actually um, is of. And essentially this is the roof of the mouth here where the tongue would have rested. 
um, more videos. Uh, so you can see this individual here is uh, being prepped and this individual on the left is also at my house because I, I decided to get really ambitious and I'm going to prep a lot during quarantine. Um, but here is an individual that is already prepped out on the right hand side of an adult um, gone with the air. And you can see this long portion here, that's that long elongated chin, essentially the lower tusks would be coming out of this back end, or this forward end, sorry. And then this top part here, these long top processes are the parts that actually attach to um, the upper jaw so that they can hinge and open their mouth. Um, and the teeth are here. You can see that there's wear going on towards that last tooth in the back. Um, so this is a mature adult um, midlife or so. And here's that recent baby baby uh, that we found about two weeks ago at Montbrook before uh, we went into quarantine. Um, and in the still picture here, you can see a little portion of the tusks. So this individual does have its tusks, which you'll show just a little bit. Um, but because of the rain we had last week, that portion that was holding up the tusks, that sand that was holding them up safely, unfortunately um, collapsed under it. So the tusks did break off, um, but we were able to collect them, um, which is fine, it happens. I just need to finish cleaning them and gluing them back together. For now, I will keep them off of the skull until uh, we can go back to the lab. Um, having the tusks attached might make it a little more difficult to transport. But um, as of today, I have glued uh, the, the skull, the bone has dried off enough to where I've um, poured glued on it so that when I'm cleaning it, I'm not accidentally removing the bone and removing those important features. Uh, but it looks fairly complete. You can see this concavity here is where um, the nasal structure would be, and that's kind of where the trunk would come off. Um, there's other bones here off to the side. We have a bunch of turtle. So turtle bone um, is often found at the site and also often found with um, attached to the, turtle, to the elephants themselves. I'm sure that will go into my children's story at some point. Um, but this little guy is pretty cute. Uh, and I'm really excited to continue prepping, prepping it during, during quarantine. So stay tuned through my social media accounts um, to keep track of, of its life's journey on my kitchen table. All right, and so like I mentioned, we have gonfathiers and all of the pictures that I've shown you up until now are of those gonfathiers that we're, we have at the Montbrook site. But this uh, picture here is really special. This is of a baby mastodon itself. And like I mentioned, we do have mastodons at the site. And this specimen is also one of those unique um, specimens where we found the lower jaw and the skull together. So we know it comes from the same individual. And I'm really excited because it has um, an area where the lower tusks would be coming out of the lower jaw. And you can see just the new replacement tusk, it's adult tusk kind of growing out um, of the lower jaw. And I'm really excited to see how it turns out once it's finished prepping. Um, this is another one of those individuals that uh, probably will be ready for research and display by the end of the year. So stay tuned for that. Um, and now just on to the workforce. So obviously this takes a huge amount of effort and work to do. And the Montbrook site would be nowhere without our volunteers. Um, and since Mar or, excuse me, since November of 2015, we've had over 800 volunteers at the site and they have really been the ones instrumental in helping us dig and find all of the specimens that we found. Um, volunteers have really been the ones who have found the really important stuff, which I'll go into in a little bit. Um, but essentially, I want to discuss the difference between a volunteer and a super volunteer. So a volunteer is someone who freely offers to take part in the enterprise of um, doing something without a monetary compensation. Whereas a super volunteer is a volunteer who donates over 10 hours per week to a single organization without monetary compensation as well. Um, 
And I want to say that many of the people pictured in these three images are of our super volunteers. I think 25% of our volunteer force are super volunteers and they have donated hundreds, if not thousands of man hours over the past um, four or five years to the site. And if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have the treasures that we have now. Our volunteers are actually made up of a lot of retirees, educators. We have a great educator program where we bring K-12 teachers to the state and give them a chance to dig and help them bring those stories back to their classroom to bring real life experiences to their students. Um, we also have a great student volunteer program. As long as the student is over 16 years of age, they can come dig at the site and get that experience. So we have students um, in high school who dream of becoming paleontologists and now they're getting this great experience actually doing paleontological work. Um, we have a high school fossil club that comes out yearly, uh, the Gainesville Youth Fossil Club. Um, they come out yearly and help us dig. We have college classrooms that drive from across the country to help us dig, not just students from UF, but we've had um, St. Olaf um, College come out. We've had um, ETSU come out and dig as well. And so that is a really robust um, group of volunteers, but we also have vacationers. We've had several couples who come out and volunteer during their anniversary. And I think that's the best kind of anniversary to spend digging out at the site. Um, so now back to the really cool fossils, like I mentioned, apart from the elephants, which I think are really cool, um, we have some other really cool um, stuff. So if you know anything about bird fossils, they don't preserve very well. Luckily, we have, uh, we have Cindy down here, um, who is kind of like our bird whisperer, and she has done a great job finding bird fossils at the site, including the oldest North American swan or swan in North America. Um, we also have found a deer. Um, you can hear, see here a portion of the, of the antler of the deer the dog is held here. Uh, this volunteer here found it. Um, probably our crowning for some, our crowning jewel is our saber-toothed cat, uh, Rhizosmilodon fitae, and it still has one of its uh, canines. And the skull is pretty crushed. This is the inside of the mouth with the underside of the skull sitting in this foam. Um, but it still has its, uh, its teeth in it, and it's just a really cool specimen. My understanding of the species is that it's been described from very small bits and pieces, and now we have a complete skull to, um, to describe it, uh, better describe that species with. Um, we've also found a lynx-like animal, which is this lower portion here, and one of our super volunteers also found it. And I will say out of the two, four, five pictures here, um, about half of these fossils have been found by um, super volunteers. So really they're putting in that work and um, finding these incredible things. And we have many, many more to be identified, um, but this is just a small sample of what's been found so far. Uh, we do have a small exhibit at the Florida Museum right now um, based on Mobrick stuff. Uh, so you can see the um, saber-toothed cat skull there, the lynx. Um, for those in Florida, once things ease up, the museum is free to visit. If you're willing to um, come visit us in Florida, the museum is free to visit and you can see these um, for free, uh, which I think is really cool. Uh, and just a little future research for myself. So uh, I will be studying um, the isotope uh, composition of these elephant teeth um, to figure out what they were eating. Uh, and since we had several mega herbivores at the site, not just the gonkers, but also the mastodons and um, the rhinos, you know, how were they, how were they partitioning the environments? Um, we have some other really cool fossils as well, uh, including this articulated foot, um, which we have an undergrad working on um, prepping and will most likely be helping um, with the scanning of these fossils so that we can create a 3D puzzle as well as we can reconstruct it through 3D. I don't know what's happening over here. Um, 
And also we'll do a species determination on those gonfathiers and look at paleoecology reconstruction. Um, so stay tuned for that, like I mentioned. Um, and I just want to say a big thank you to everyone that has helped out with the site. There are several grants here um, that have uh, contributed to the digging. Um, so thank you to that. And also a huge shout out to the private owners uh, that own the land that have been amazing and instrumental in um, uh, being open to having just days of random people uh, coming by to help dig. And um, I'm just really, really glad we get to be out at the site. Um, so with that, uh, Gabe and Brittany, if we want to just move on to questions. Um, Hello, that was super interesting. That was so cool. I love your research and Montbrook. I'm still sad I've never been able to visit in all the times I've come visit you all. Yeah, you come at the wrong times. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Florida Natural History Museum is amazing, um, but I also have not had a chance to see Montbrook, which I'm sad about because I love Propositions. Yeah, it's, it's pretty wonderful. So you guys need to come out at the right time. Yes. We'll talk more. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a question. This is from Denise. Does Hunter still visit and dig? Uh, so that's a fun story. Um, recently, my major advisor and one of the curators at the museum, Dr. McFadden, um, went to her school uh, and didn't realize that that was the school that Hunter attended. And um, I believe that uh, there might be more partnerships um, involving her in the future, but she has been out a couple times um, and she's now, I want to say, what, nine, almost 10 years old. Um, so it's been kind of cool to to know that, you know, she she found this site and she's a local hero to me. So awesome. I love it. How many fathers get to say that they found something like that? I know. Yeah, like one. <laughs> <laughs> At least. Um, here's one from Matthew. Um, <laughs> I like this question because it involves Mastodon. How many years can Mastodon uh, so live? So that's a great question. And this is kind of lumped in with all, all proboscideans. So we know that modern proboscideans, I believe, um, can grow to 60 to 80 years or so. And so we assume the same for mastodons and mammoths and gonfathiers and based on the amount of teeth in their jaw. So at least with gonfathiers, they go through six teeth in their lifetime. Um, we think they're probably reaching around 40 to 60 years or so. So uh, I'm not too caught up on mastodon age. Um, research but i'm assuming it's around that same they are they do have lifespans similar to humans interesting um this one is from maddie um you mentioned subspecies of the african elephants today and mentioned that your elephants might be able to be divided into subspecies will you look at the morphology for that or can isotopes show you yeah, the difference? so with the two uh, potential gonfathier species that we have there so they would be there um they would be probably two individual species uh i don't know if we'd be able to figure out subspecies from the fossils um themselves but uh, I don't think we'd be able to partition that out from the isotopes. That would be uh, more so morphologically. So looking at, at characteristics of the skull, of the lower jaws, um, those characteristics that make it a gonfathier, we'd be able to see how much difference is between them. And then we'd have to figure out if that is individual variation. So if you look at the three of us on the screen, the three of us are humans, but we look very different from each other, meaning that there is some individual variation between the three of us. So there is also that within, um, yeah. within other uh, animal species. Um, so we'd have to be able to partition individual variation between the gonfathiers um, apart from just species differences. Wow. Awesome. Britt, I have a question really quick. Uh, sure. This one's actually from my nephews. I had promised oh. that I would ask for them. Uh, this one's from Brandon and James. Uh, they're asking, 
how can they be scientists and how smart do they need to be? You don't need to be very smart. So just a little backstory. Um, I failed too many math classes to be proud of. Um, and yet somehow here I am getting a PhD. So uh, I don't think intelligence place too much of a key, at least not in the sense of that we are um, led to believe that um, you have to have straight A's to be a scientist. I think it's a passion and a, uh, um, a persistence that leads you to be a scientist and really um, being persistent and looking for ways to do science. So for your niece and nephew, um, I would recommend having them get involved with the museum since they already know someone at a museum. Um, but there are other really cool uh, community science projects that they can be involved with um, to start learning. So there's uh, um, like the Aurora Fossil Museum, they can request matrix from their school through there and they can start learning how to identify fossils by picking through uh, fossil matrix and learning to identify and really just reading and trying to learn what it is that they're interested in. And um, when they reach certain ages, they can start volunteering. I know um, the Hot Spring Mammoth site has a volunteer program. I think they start from friends' experiences at a fairly young age. So there's, uh, there are opportunities for them. Awesome. Thank you. I'm sure they're very much happy to hear that. Yeah. And not just <laughs> Here's a, another question from a, a young viewer. Um, she's uh, Adrina and she's eight years old. She wants to know if you have a drawing of what the four test elephants look like. Yeah, hi Adrina. Um, that is a great question. And personally, I cannot draw to save my life. Um, my stick figures are, are an embarrassment. Um, but we do have some very talented uh, artists who um, merge their scientific interests with art and they're called essentially paleo artists or scientific illustrators. Um, and they've done a really good job um, depicting uh, different species. And the picture I'm about to share with the screen like I mentioned earlier in the talk is not of the Montbrook site, but you can kind of get an idea of what the elephants look like. So this elephant here, uh, you can see the upper tusk sticking out here and then the lower tusks are kind of just sticking out over the top two tusks. Um, so we think based on the shape of their skull where their nasal cavity is, where their, their nostrils would be, is in the same location as African and Asian elephants. So we assume that they also have a trunk. Um, so we've always had depictions of these gonfathiers with trunks and, and tusks. That's a really good question. Um, if you don't mind me jumping in, I have a question from a friend um, who is joining us from Colombia, um, and he wants to know uh, why there are so many juveniles and babies at the site and uh, if normally we would expect a lot of older individuals. And that's actually a really great question and a portion of my dissertation. So thank you Aldo for bringing that up. Um, so that's one of the mysteries of Montbrook. We want to know why there are so many of those teenage juvenile elephants at the site. Um, we think that it has to do with uh, an attritional, um, an attritional buildup of fossils. And by attritional, I mean a long-term buildup of fossils at this site. So it wasn't a catastrophic event that would have taken out an entire herd of elephants. So there wasn't, you know, like a flash flood that would have taken out a herd of elephants or we would see a different structure um, of the fossils there. But we think it was a slow buildup over time of um, elephant fossils and we think that that might be responsible for it but like I mentioned stay tuned over the next couple years as I come up with those answers um, yeah so thank you for that really hard question <laughs> I, don't know. I think it's cool because like those kinds of questions are the part are the questions that send you off on research like, oh we, we right. don't know the answer to that right. let's go find out and then you know however many right. years on a PhD. Right. Hopefully not too much longer. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully with all this, you can, you're not being too delayed, right? Like you're still able to work at home and everything. 
Right. So I'm at a point right now where I'll be doing my qualifying exams over the next, um, in about a month and a half or so. So it gives me plenty of time um, to focus on reading and research and preparing for those exams. So it forces me to sit down and um, actually work on prepping the fossils. Um, I haven't had much time because I keep uh, coming up with some fun broader impacts activities that I keep, <laughs> keep requiring too much of my time. So it's, it's both helpful and not. I can't do the in the lab analyses that I need to do, but at the same time, it's forcing me to sit down and do the reading and um, get to know, to know my fossils personally. Right. Do you have any like Ooh. advice you would give to like younger people in, or people in earlier in their PhDs, what they could do right now to, stay like strong through all this right now um yeah definitely if you can keep in contact with your lab just to stay sane and stay motivated and talk about other things and be be brutally honest with yourself and recognize that it's okay to not be motivated um but then you know take the time to to deal with the lack of motivation and give yourself some time and relax and do other things that that you like to do that aren't around your research because I know I feel the need to be working from the moment I wake up till you know three four five in the morning um because I'm home I should be doing work I should be you know producing stuff so trying to stay on a same schedule and doing outside of work um to feel comfortable and know that it's okay to be unmotivated that's just you your body telling you to relax for a little bit but also know you can't remain unmotivated for a full week which i'm sad to inform you i've done um and then this week i had to catch up on everything i didn't do last week um so just really trying to to create a schedule and stay um, manage your time and respect the fact that you do need to relax and you do need to cope with what's happening um those worries that are happening so this is a weird time and we're kind of the ones who are going to write the book on how to deal with with crazy pandemics so yeah going to take notes for my own um, <laughs> grad school experience right now yeah. <laughs> awesome here's another question um this is from cindy do we think that baby gonfathiers might be born with their tusks already slightly erupted or does that happen? Um, yeah, that's a really interesting born? question. Um, I don't know if it's in the literature yet for other proboscidean types. Um, from what I've seen at the fossils on um, at Montbrook, they seem to already have some milk tusks. Uh, in place. Um, granted, these animals could be a year or so old, so I don't know when that incisor erupts. That might, um, I'm sure that's in the literature somewhere. Um, but uh, if this is the Cindy, I think this is, uh, she also knows that uh, there might be some potential of having some super extremely natal uh, babies that uh, or at least bones of um, extremely young or maybe not born babies at the site um, based on the formation of the bone itself so uh, who knows maybe in a couple years we'll find one with just the baby tusk just erupting that's I know it's morbid to think about, but I'm also excited to find a newborn baby elephant. <laughs> There's so much cool stuff at Montbrook. What the heck? So much cool oh. stuff. I know. I'm so jealous. Um, let's see. It looks like we have one more question from the Western Science Center stream. This is from Jerry. Do you have any thoughts as to why several distinct proboscidean lineages lost their lower tusks during the Pliocene and the Pleistocene? That's a great question. I don't have an answer from the literature because um, like I mentioned before, I keep finding other uh, activities to, uh, to pull me away from the literature. But just from an informed thought, um, we don't see tusks in modern elephants and it might just be that uh, that lineage didn't have a use for them. And so spending the energy to create um, those tasks was just a waste of time uh, and waste of resources. So they may have just not, um, with mastodons, they may have just 
not use them in their day-to-day uh, -day activity and the, the individuals that didn't have them were able to survive longer and then um, that trait kind of fell um, on the wayside for, for Mastodon um, and they use that energy and resources uh, to produce other structures, um, either make their teeth uh, more robust or their tusks might have grown longer or um, something. But that's a really interesting question that maybe Brittany will address. <laughs> maybe one day. I'm, it, I am super <laughs> interested in it because um, we, um, for everybody's context for uh, this stream, um, I work at the Western Science Center. Uh, which last year named the Pacific Mastodon, Mammut Pacificus, uh, my boss, Dr. Alton Dooley, and a uh, team of Pacific experts uh, named that last year. And Pacific Mastodons do not have at all, pretty much, um, lower tusks, lower mandibular tusks, while you do occasionally see them in American Mastodon populations. Um, and so we don't know why either. Um, like Jeanette was saying, it's it might be based on resources. Like if you don't need those tusks, why are you going to bother putting so much energy into uh, creating them? Uh, so we don't know either, but it's something I've been interested in because yeah, pretty much every Pacific Mastodon we see does not have mandibular tusks at all, um, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's we we've, we've just realized that we have this new species. And so now we have all these questions about, oh, now we know there's a new species. Why is it like this? Right. <laughs> That's a great question. That was a, a really lot of these. Question. I love how a lot of these questions are questions that we're trying to investigate and come up with answers. I think that that's just a great way of showing that as scientists, we don't know everything. And that's why science and being interested in science is so important because everyone has these questions or has interesting questions. Oh no, we might have lost Jeanette. Oh man. Oh wait, dear. Well, we wait for Jeanette to try to connect back. Oh, there we go. Are you back, Jeanette? There we go. Thank goodness. Okay. <laughs> we lost you for a second. I think it got overcast outside. Um, oh. Um, oh, Florida. Say, oh, Florida. Because, like, what you're saying is really cool, especially <laughs> Montbrook's a great example of that because it's not just scientists there, it's scientists, volunteers, and people on so many different levels working together. And I think that's kind of kind of unique to what you all do in Gainesville, right? Like you work very closely with the community and the um, advocational amateur paleontology community. What's that been like for you? Because it's not something we do very commonly here in California, at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will say that um, luckily it's not unique to Florida. We do have other institutions uh, in the country that do that. I know ETSU does that, um, East Tennessee State University at the Gray Fossil Site, I believe they have a volunteer program. Um, the Mammoth Hot Site has a volunteer program. I know several dinosaur sites may also have a volunteer program. But um, unique to me, I, I know that for me, science is not just the questions that we answer, but also um, how we share and interact with the community because science isn't just for scientists. Scientists is for all of us to learn and to wonder over. Um, and so being able to work with uh, the amateur community is really important because it helps me realize that as scientists, we don't know all the answers. And sometimes people that have jobs in other sectors may know more than us based on their hobbies and their interests. And it's really important to remember to include everyone in our science. So whether is that that's making a site accessible, making our scientific literature accessible in different ways, either through, um, through popular news articles or through social media stories, whatever the case may be, just really making um, science accessible both in the classroom and outside of it. Awesome, thanks Jeanette. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I think we've gotten through all of the questions on the chat. Do you have any other questions from your friends or? Um, no, I think, I think that is it um, for that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jeanette, for joining us today. Um, thank you for having me. This was right in my own wheelhouse. So this was super interesting to me personally. But I think in everyone as well. I mean, there was a turtle in a coffee yeah, your jaw. So. It's really that was too cool. Yeah, yeah, that was amazing. I'm really glad you guys didn't prep that. Yeah, it, 
I know there were talks because they're all like, oh, Jeanette needs to look at the teeth. And I'm like, but we can see teeth scan it. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Don't take it out. <laughs> yeah. Has it been like a weird thing having the fossils at your house and your kitchen table turning into a prep lab or something? <laughs> Yeah, uh, my partner kind of just looks at me and is like, where do I set my things? And I'm like, mm -hmm. the cat is unhappy that I've taken up one of his window spots, but you know, whatever. Um, and yeah, it's kind of fun because I can be waiting for dinner to be ready and just kind of walk over and prep a little corner and then, you know, do dishes and then come back and prep a little corner. So uh, it's really kind of um it's nice and I, I might get too used to it and I may not want to go back to my office back on campus <laughs> that's left to be conference. determined right <laughs> right oh really quick before I forget um I yeah. just want to send a special thank you to the folks at the fossil project for uh, supporting mm -hmm. the fossil friday chats and setting it out Jeanette you worked uh with that for a while I did too, right um, I did so a quick thing about that yeah, so the Fossil Project is this uh, wonderful uh, program, and I might be biased, like I said, uh, because like Gabe mentioned, I worked for the Fossil Project for the last few years that um, we had grant money for it, but it still lives. So the Fossil Project is the initiative to really bring professional paleontologists, aka those with um, degrees or jobs in paleontology with amateur paleontologists or um, people who have a strong interest and um, are hobbyists in paleontology but may not actually work as paid professional, hold a diploma in paleontology. Um, only because, like I mentioned earlier, uh, hobbyists and amateur and um, avocational paleontologists sometimes either know more about a certain species that they've been really interested in or have their own private collections as there are way um, you can get permits uh, to collect uh, certain types of fossils but those are state dependent so if you're interested in that check out the laws um, with your state a great way to do that is check in with um, but eventually creating a space where um, amateur paleontologists could share their personal collections and if they um, are of scientific interest create collaborations with professionals so that those private collections can be made um, made uh, available to science and right now uh, has started in e museum and that was through the postdoc that Dr. Jen Bauer over in Michigan um, did where she helped create the electronic museum through the My Fossil Project. Um, and you can find the Fossil Project both um, by going to myfossil.org or on various social media platforms. Um, and if you have your own private collection, you can photograph and start curating your collection into a personal museum online and um, we can help you with identifications. And it's just, it was a great introduction for paleo, uh, to paleontology for me because my background is not paleo. So it was, it was a way to force me to learn how to identify and interact and learn um, different fossils, not just in the late Miocene, but really across um, geologic time. So uh, fossil project is near and dear to my heart. It's such an awesome project. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. And also, thank you again to everyone at the Fossil Project, especially Sam, uh, for posting all of our stuff Sam. and really getting Fossil Friday chats out there. So thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us for uh, this edition of the Fossil Friday web chats. We will be back next week. Um, so check us out then. Um, we will have more information on the times on our websites and on our social media pages. Again, if you, this is a collaboration between the Western Science Center in Hemet, California and the Raymond M. Alf Museum in Claremont, California. Um, obviously, we know times are tough, but if you do feel like you would like to support um, our endeavors and our programs, we will have information for um, supporting our programs um, after this uh, live stream is over. Um, also, the Western Science Center is soliciting um, donations to help offset the cost of plastic as we have repurposed our 3D printing lab uh, to produce PPE for local healthcare providers. So if you are in a position to give, it would be much appreciated but please do not feel obligated and we will see you all next week thanks guys thanks for having bye. me and thanks for joining us bye have a good weekend